Come and leave it there I was down With no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well And I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free
as a new musical genre that was legitimate and rap was going to be around forever. We know they were right. And then they also spoke with the main idea of their song, Bring the Noise, was about the fact that um, there are some rap, there are some rap musicians who are going to make sure that the truth of this rap material continues to last forever. What they were saying is we're unstoppable. What they would tell anybody who listened, and especially the DJs that were afraid to play their music, they wanted them to know, no matter what's going to happen, we're going to keep bringing the noise. And we're going to continue to be unstoppable. You can't stop us. As a matter of fact, the hook to the song was turn it up, bring the noise. Turn it up, bring the noise. Interestingly enough, there was also a Broadway music, Tony Award winning Broadway play called Bring the Noise, Bring the Funk. And this play was celebrated for the uniqueness of its ability to tell the history of slavery through tap, rap, and song, and they brought about a new expression of music called tap. Rap. It was such groundbreakingly important because it made sure you understood that African Americans were not going to be denied as freedom. It took us systematically on the journey to show us that at every phase, African Americans fought back. They would bring the noise and they would bring the fault. The play was directed by George Wolfe, who actually run a Tony as best director of a musical. The lyrics were by George Wolfe and by uh, Anne Ducanet, and she actually won a Tony that year as uh, for best performance in a musical. And then, of course, the celebrated Savion Glover, he won a Tony for best director. What was so important about this is that on each turn, they wanted to show the perseverance of African Americans in each song, in each dance, in each tap, told the story of we're going to continue to bring the noise, we're going to continue to bring the phone, and you can't stop us no matter what. And both of these projects, both of these have similar characteristics in them because they highlighted, so first, they highlighted that in order for a movement to be unstoppable, you have to have individuals who won't be stopped. And so in the Public Enemy song, there was the fact that they highlighted or celebrated rappers of that day who they felt were important pioneers and icons of the rap who would keep the truth going. They, in the song, they celebrated Run DMC. In the song, they celebrated Eric B. In the song, they celebrated LL Cool J and said no matter what happened, they won't be stopped because these individuals will carry on. And on the play, bring the praise, bring the noise, bring the funk. In that play, they actually celebrated. Behind them were scenes of African Americans during certain times and certain periods in history. And they showed individuals who represented the tenacity of the movement. They showed individuals who said, I won't be moved, who are going to go through, break through, and make sure things are going to happen. What I'm telling you is that in order for anybody to be unmoved, for a movement to be unstoppable, for a movement to keep bringing enough noise that people are going to hear them and change, is you got to have an individual that wants to crash through every obstacle, wants to know that I will not be stopped. you got to have an individual who says, no matter what you place in front of me, that obstacle will not hold me. Now I'm flipping, I need you to know something. That's what God wants for every one of his children. Some of you are too passive. Some of you are sitting around not realizing. God wants you to know that you're unstoppable because of his word. But he wants you to bring the noise. He wants you every time life throws something at you. And they start bringing it up like, bring it. I'm going to bring mine right back. He wants you constantly moving forward. Some of you have resolved yourself to allow whatever life gives you to stay there. And God is saying, why are you doing that when I left you enough power that you can move on and not have to worry about what life is saying? All I'm telling you is, while you're sitting there whining, while you're sitting there complaining, God has said, no, nah, that's not the kind of service that make it. My service that make it are the ones, whether they're hurting, whether they're down, whether they're sick, whether they're out of it, whether they're broke, they're constantly looking up to heaven, and if somebody asks them, they will bring the noise. You know what they'll do? They'll say, God is good. They'll say, my God is working it out. You know what they'll who sits around with all God has done for them and let themselves be bruised and abused by the enemy and by life, then they need to turn this thing around and learn how to bring the noise and bring 
the thumb. This Canaanite woman is going to show us from a position where she was depleted of all self-respect, where she was in a position where she had no right to be, where she was somewhere where she knew she should not have been asking for help, but she made up her mind that no matter how bad, no matter how much you talk about me, no matter how you try to turn me aside, I'm going to keep bringing the noise. I need somebody to hear me right now. You ought to be bringing some noise right in your house right now. You ought to let the enemy know this sad person who went through this week being broken and being bruised, I still got a praise for God. I still got my joy. I still maintain that my God can get me through. Somebody ought to shake this up and realize if we can learn how to bring the noise when everything get weak and bring the fault. Listen, God has left us too many weapons for us to be down. Think about all God has left us that makes us unstoppable. Are you with me? First, God left us his word. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven, Matthew 24, 24, 35 says, heaven and earth must pass away before God's word will fail. Did you hear that? So if there's failure going on in our lives, the failure is not with God. He said, heaven and earth must pass away. And he said, my word will never, ever fail. He left us supernatural promises in his word. God has promised peace. When it look like the situation should be peaceful, he's promised us joy, overflowing joy when it looks like everything's dark in our life. He's promised us his presence. He would never leave us nor forsake us. He's promised us help. He's promised us resources. And one of the greatest promises, I know I like to rely on this one because this one brings me joy at all times. You know what God had a nerve to say? John 10.10 10, The thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. That's if you're still on that Satan tip. If you're still running around, not redeemed, don't have God in your life, then you have to worry about that. But it's but Jesus said in that same text, but I come that you might have life and that more abundantly. What, what kind of life was God talking about? He was talking about abundant life. He was talking about uh, that high life. He was talking about a life that cannot be dulled or dulled by what I'm going through. A life that will never get up. There's somebody here watching me right now that can identify every time I feel like giving up something stirs on the inside of my soul and I feel like going on. That old Negro spiritual. I feel like going on. Some days I may not have the feeling on my body, but there's a feeling in my spirit saying I'm going to go on. That's right. Stop right now. I wish I could freeze the recording. I'm going to tell somebody right here, I want you to say this. I'm going to go on, no matter what my condition. Now, while I move on, you keep praising God for your going on. Because you're going to continue to bring the praise and be unstoppable. He left us the Holy Spirit. You know what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit actually speaks for us when I don't know what to say. Oh, my God. The Holy Spirit will, will, will speak words. Romans uh, 8, 26, write this down. Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities. That's what Romans 8, 26 says. It starts out, the Spirit helps my weaknesses, my infirmities. It helps those areas in my life where I am shallow in. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings, watch this, which cannot be uttered. My God. The Holy Spirit, when I'm sitting there and I make sure I keep my focus open, will grow up to God with words that I may not understand. And he will tell God what I need and God will bless us. He left us the miracle. He left us the promise of supernatural miracles. Now, I got to stop because somebody said, whoa, whoa, pastor, you don't go too far. What are you talking about? You better hear me. I'm not talking about, you know, no, uh, this is how that some of the uh, doctrine out there today has got people all jacked up because they're running around chasing miracles. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you forgot the very miracle of your existence now as a believer in Christ when I talk about supernatural promises. Understand what I'm saying. Here's what God gave us. The Bible tells us that uh, I don't have to run around and talk about it, rubbing the genie and get three wishes. I don't have to talk about, you know, trying to divide the ocean anymore. Some of the promises and miracles for the Bible were done during those times because they were appropriate for God to continue to make his will known unto man and for God's purpose. Miracles are always for God's purpose. Somebody who is mature understands that 
And maybe the reason you can't get a miracle because you don't understand the miracle is when you're mature enough so you don't go crazy when the miracle happens. But anyway, here's the miracle I'm talking about. The miracle of answered prayer. That may not seem like much to you. But there's people out there that don't even understand when you get down on your knees and you start saying, Lord, no child, I got to pray. You know why you say you got to pray? Because it's already passed through your spirit that the God I'm talking to is really able to hear and bless me. It's, it's a miracle because we know, and I know you know, and I know somebody listening to me, even if you got weak for a moment, you know that there were some things in your past that you prayed for, and you can't give an explanation as to how or why it happened. I feel the Holy Spirit coming now, but if you understood it, you would be able to tell yourself, God did it. All of us got it. God did it somewhere in our mind, and then sometimes we just break out and don't realize, God provides food, and, and, and we were eating when we didn't have anything. I didn't have a job, but God provided, and now I got a better job. I, uh, I, I found myself with bills that I couldn't pay, and God paid the bills. I, I found myself that close, come on, that close to, to, you know, we had to get out and try to forget about those things, but I find myself that close to wanting to give up, but God did a miracle, and he strengthened me, even, I don't know how he did it when I wasn't looking. 1 John 5, 14 tells us, and this is the confidence. We know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's, the, that's a miracle to me, that we have answered prayer by God. And finally, one of the greatest that relates back to this Canaanite woman, the best miracle that God has given us, the best power God has left us, is the power of our faith. I like it. My faith separates me from other believers. I don't have to be saved as long if another believer has lost their way. I don't have to worry about what you think. My faith is my faith, and I can grow my faith as high as I want to grow. Your faith is only limited to the amount of words you take in and the amount of trust that you have in God. But there is no limitations to your faith. I love the fact that God has given us the ability to have faith in Him, and He proves Himself over and over to us. Sometimes we like to uh, try to distinguish mustard seed faith from mountain moving faith, but the reality is they're both the same thing. Matthew 17, 20 said, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, I don't want to go into the passage, you know the passage, go check out the background, but it says, for verily I say unto you, Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you can speak unto that mountain, remove and be taken hence, and the mountain will be removed to a yonder place. But here's the part I like. It shall be removed and nothing shall be impossible to you. Go with me into the mindset of the Canaanite woman, the Gentile, the woman who had everything against her, who had no right being in Jesus' face. We got a right sometimes and we won't get it. Look at her gall. Look at her. Look, look at how uh, expressive she was. Look at her desire and her resolve to say, I'm going to keep bringing the noise. They tried to shut her up. She said, I'm going to bring the noise. You know what? I'm going to be unstoppable until I get my daughter healed. Come on, go with me. She said, I am not going to give up. And if everything against me, that's not easy to see. I'm only, I'm only pushing this because some of you have like, what you going to do is the worst thing going on. But everybody has everything against them. But faith can move your mountain just a little bit of it. And you can move. I'd like to share with you where I'm going, give you a direction so you can follow the text. So one thing we need to see this woman is done. She's going to teach us lessons from this Canaanite woman. We'll, we'll take your faith to another level. You know what she did? The first thing is you got to learn, if you want to be a stop, if you want to continue to bring your noise, when life throws noise at you, you're going to throw some noise back. Here's what you need to understand. First, you've got to press through the silence. There's going to be moments when God is silent. you got to learn how to press through the silent times of God. Because those silent moments can mess you up. you got to learn how to press through the impossibilities. Some things seem impossible, but you got to press through that. Just because somebody else didn't get it don't mean God. Oh, if somebody lets you see that, God's not going to do it for you. And thirdly, you got to press through relentlessly. So we find out in this, 
If we were to look at this text and get a context of our text, the first point, press through the silence, we'll find out that Jesus in 13, chapter 13 and 14, was in the middle, right in the middle of the main uh, push of his mission. He was doing miracles. He was healing. He was teaching. And if we go into chapter 13 and 14, we find out some of the things that Jesus had done. He had been on a constant, constant roll. He fed the 5,000. Uh, 5,000 folk, and he walked out on the water, and you know, that's when Peter asked that he come out. He went through all of that, and then we, that was in 13, 14, then when we get to chapter 15, we find out the text tells us, so get a context, that Jesus then went and departed unto the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Understand! That word departed in the Greek means that he had gone for a rest. He had to walk over 50 miles, but he was going to Tyre and Sidon. He left Gennesaret. He left the area he was going to. He left the Jewish area, went to a Gentile area. And while he was in this Gentile area, he thought no Jews would be around because all the miracles Jesus did had drawn great crowds to him. But it also got into all these tiring battles with the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders. You know, if you look at the first 20 verses of our text, it's the religious leaders who are jealous of Jesus because he has crowds, jealous of Jesus because he's doing miracles and people are following him. You ever notice how some think our people are jealous of your relationship with God because you seem to be on fire and you seem to be joyous and they want to try to catch you so they want to try to catch you in something? Well, that's what they were doing. These religious leaders knew they couldn't stop the real power of God. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to catch Jesus doing something against the law. So if you look at what they were talking about here, they asked him this silly question. Why do your disciples eat with unwashing hands? Why aren't they following the Jewish ritual of washing their hands? And what's really crazy about the text is Jesus was letting them know as he went through you know, all they were saying is that you were unclean and you can't go into heaven if, if, you, if you don't follow the rituals. And they were trying to catch Jesus with his disciples so they could say his disciples were unclean so they could say that he was not a good prophet or a good teacher. But they couldn't catch him, amen, because Jesus gave them a divine kingdom answer. I don't have time to go over, but if you look at it, Jesus always blew them away because his answers were divine and they could not come back or defeat them because they were above their knowledge. That's why the enemy can't stop you most times because Jesus has baffled him. And they were, you know, they were out there trying to catch Jesus and, and tell people what they shouldn't do and what they do. If you go to church, uh, not your church, but some other church, I know we haven't been to church in a while, but if you go to church, you find out there's a whole lot of folk in church that love to tell you what's holy and what's not holy. They love to tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know. But you know what? But you listen to them. And if you do decide to listen to them, all I want you to do is promise me, follow them for a little while. It will not be long before what they're talking about, they're going to mess up. Because they think they got this holy stuff down. But you know if you follow them, you're going to find out none of us have arrived. As a matter of fact, I'm preaching you right now. I give you no invitations to follow me. Don't try to follow me. I'm still working out my stuff day by day. And if you're honest with yourself, that's what you're doing. So that's why Jesus said it was tiring. But we find out in the Gospel of Mark, which is the sister text to this in Mark chapter 7, we find out that uh, he went there because he wanted, as he thought no one would find him. Several things happened because of this. The Gentiles and the non-Jews heard that Jesus were coming. That's how this Canaanite woman found him. Which shows us that Jesus, is, is Jesus, when he knows you have a need, he comes to you even when he's tired. Even when, even when he knows, here's what I want to say. Your need drives Jesus to you and your actions don't drive Jesus from you. Now, if you're not shouting on that, you better start. Because here's what I said. I'm glad that my need makes Jesus come closer. He knows he's close to those of a contract spirit and a broken heart. He always knows what I need before I ask for it. He always knows where I'm at. He always feels what's going on in my life. Jesus, even though the Bible says we must come to him by faith, the Bible says also we have not a Savior who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I have a God who looks at me just like I look at my child, like you look at your child, 
and say, I need to show up because my child is hurting. Don't you ever for a moment think that Jesus doesn't know you're hurting. And if he knows you're hurting, even though he was going on vacation, even though he was going to rest, Jesus makes sure he shows up when you need him. I got good news for somebody. The very fact that you have a need means that Jesus is on the way to show up to you because you are the one that he shows up to, the ones who are broken and hurt. That's why he'll leave the 99 and go after the one sheep that just got away. I'm telling you, this shows us that Jesus, and the crazy, crazy thing was, this woman should not have been able to, able to even say, Jesus, I need your help. But he loved her anyway. And the second thing is, he's never too busy to stop and see about us. Now, that's important because Jesus is the only one who can stop what he's doing. And he's doing a whole lot. He's, he's running the universe. But he will stop from the universe, come see about me. It's impressive that he will do that. And we can cheer that he will do that. But that's not the real blessing. The blessing is even when he stops running the universe, all he has to do is command the universe to keep going. Because the only reason other folk can't, won't ever be too busy to stop seeing about you, your mama may want to see about you, but she may be working, she may be too busy. Your husband may be sick in the bed. All I'm telling you is Jesus is the only one who is never too busy to see about you because he has enough power to keep going, doing what he's doing, and to come see about you. Right now, Jesus will stop heaven for you. Verse 22 tells us, and behold, a Canaanite woman came out of the same coast, and cried, saying, Have mercy on me, thou son of David. And he answered her not a word. Press on through the silence. This Greek woman, Hannah, not a Jew, a Gentile, and it was against the law for Jesus to be around, for them to come and try to get what was meant and preserved for the Jewish, for God's children. This woman came and said, Oh Lord! She was crying. She was in distress. She said, Have mercy on me. My daughter is vexed with a devil. And when she came in to see him, she called him Lord, and she called him thou son of David. You ought to check this. This means this woman knew what she was doing. She was not there randomly. She was ready to bring the noise because she had overstepped a whole lot of barriers to get to Jesus and to have the nerve to ask Jesus to come again. She didn't care how bad the situation looked. Look what happened. When she called him Lord, she said that meant she called him Master. A Greek. Some of the scribes and Pharisees who he was trying to help him call him master. And then she said, thou son of David. That was his messianic name. Thou son of David. He was letting him know that I know you're the Messiah who should have come. Now here's the great thing. It meant those first 20 verses of this text where Jesus was having a discord with the scribes and Pharisees, with his disciples there. Watch this, y'all. It meant he wanted his disciples there because as Jesus unleashed his love for us and his plan of salvation. He was going to save some Gentiles. He was going to save some Greeks. He was going to save some folk who were Jews. And he wanted his disciples to say, just because church folks say you're unclean, don't mean you unclean. Hallelujah. I am so glad what the world calls unclean. God knows how to clean up. So, I need you to know that when this woman came, his disciples saw that. But the text says, she called him master. So first of all, she knew who Jesus was. And she knew who she was. If you're going to stand in silence, you've got to know who Jesus is. This woman pressed on through the silence because she said, Master. She said, uh, Thou son of David, follow her. So it meant that she had surrendered herself. She knew she would do whatever Jesus asked. And so she believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the only one that had enough power to heal her daughter. So she humbled herself in front of Jesus because she knew who he was and she knew who she was. She was someone willing to trust him with everything. Let me back up so you don't lose this. Maybe the reason you don't get your blessing is you don't know who Jesus is really in all of the glory and splendor of his power. You know him as Jesus of your Sunday school or Jesus that you call on when you need something. But you don't have that intimate relationship to say that Jesus that she knew was the Jesus who fulfilled the Messianic promise and the Jesus who was her master. So here's how she pressed through the silence. Every time, Quinn, 
went through her mind. Every time she felt like she was overstepping her bounds, I believe something went through her mind and said, no, this is my only help. He's the Messiah. He has power. His name is above every name. His name is above every name. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to trust him. And then she said, and I know whose I am, meaning my life is now in his hands. And sometimes in silence, your life is the worst it's ever been, and you wonder where God is, and you want God to show up. But here's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He reminded himself when life seems like, somebody's in this, don't miss me, it seems like it's crucifying you and you haven't heard from God. Paul said this, the same thing this woman said, and he's reminding us. He said, uh, I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the life that I live, I now live by faith of the one who loved me, gave himself for me. When you know that Christ loved you and gave himself for you, you know that he is the one who has the power. She also remembered who she was. You got to remember who Jesus is. Whenever you hear silence, just hang in there because you really don't have anywhere else to go. So don't start complaining and crying. Where are you going to go? Okay, you haven't heard from him yet. It doesn't mean he left you because this woman did remember who she was. All I'm saying is um, don't pattern your life after other folk. Don't pattern your worship after what somebody else does. Now somebody said, well, I haven't heard from Jesus. I'm going to turn Jesus around. I don't know if you guys knew this, but Ted Turner, the billionaire, you know, Turner Broadcast, Turner Network, Ted Turner is a declared atheist. He has been public with how he thinks that people who follow Jesus Christ are fools. And he has been public with saying, one time he said he hoped the Pope get run over. Another time he said that he put up, that Pope had ashes on their head. He said, why y'all walk around with those ashes on? You must be Jesus freaks. And here is a strange thing. Ted Turner grew up in a Christian house. Was supposed to be a missionary. But when he was 17, his sister got sick and he prayed. Uh, sometimes 30 times a day for God to save his sister. And when his sister died, his heart got so hardened, he said, I'll never trust God again. He forgot something. Not only when God is silent must you believe that he is still listening and still with you, you must understand God's sovereignty is going to work out your situation for your on your behalf for his purpose and he missed it because here's what I tell people don't worry about other people's journeys don't let anybody influence you when you see me and you see me still serving God and looks like my life is all jacked up here's what I tell people or sometimes you see me riding around you know in a nice car and looks like God's doing taking care of me I said look I don't let anything you say judge me because here's what I know you might see my glory but you don't know my story. I stick around because you don't have the same need I have. This woman said, I got a daughter. I don't care what y'all say. I got a daughter who needs to be healed. And I'm going to stay here so God can heal her. Do you know many of us have messed ourselves up? We have backslidden. Because when God was silent, that's when we came to work. I'm talking to somebody now. I just felt you come through here. Watch this. Don't let the silence bother you because God's knowledge and his faithfulness. Always remember, don't let the silence bother you. He didn't bother this woman because she just knew who she was and what she was trying to get. But remember Mary and Martha? They let the silence almost stop them from seeing the rebirth or the resurrection of their brother. By the time Jesus showed up, do you remember that Jesus stayed where he was on purpose? And he showed up, they stayed four days more. And then when he showed up, Mary and Martha had a nerve to say to him, uh, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus wept. Because here's what he said. You didn't have enough faith in me to realize that I know what I'm going to do. So 
somebody just missed it. Whenever you're in silence, you ought to keep looking up because God got another plan. They didn't realize Lazarus was going to die, but Jesus already planned to resurrect him. While you're sitting there wondering, why did I hurt from you, God? God is saying, you don't realize I'm getting ready to do something greater in your life than you're getting ready to ask me for. Just hang on through those silent moments. You remember Job's wife, the most famous. Job's wife saw Job head to toe, filled with boils, saw Job, you know, serve. And when she saw God didn't answer Job, you know what I'm saying? She said, curse your God and die. And Job looked at her and said, woman, you must be foolish. Can I expect only good from God and not adversity? Please hear what Job said. The silence does not mean God is not with you. The silence means that God is taking us or allowing us to go through a period of adversity. And during that period, God is working something in our life that's going to make us better. And if you don't believe that, God said, please just look back. Come on, why would you start talking about me now? Think back in your life and understand, so what? I'm silent now. I must be working it out. This woman tells the story of, of being in the hospital. Her son had a car wreck. And he was not given too much chance to live. He was banged up pretty bad. He was in the hospital. She was a believer. She got her whole church and they had been praying for healing and praying for this child. And he was, you know, he was still on the monitor. She was still there. But she was getting antsy and she was getting angry because she was staying in the hospital and she was sleeping by her son's bed. And this one night after she had slept there all night, she got up kind of slow. And that's the morning she was really angry with God. She saw no change. She said, God, why don't you hear us? And she was so angry. And she, said, she walked out to go get a cup of coffee. And as she was walking out to the elevator, the elevator was full. So she decided, I'm going to take the stairs down to another floor. And didn't catch the elevator down. So she caught the stairs down to another floor. And as she did, she got off the elevator at the seventh floor. But as she got off the elevator, she looked, there was a window through this room that she was facing, and the, the picture in the window, or the view in the window looked so, you know, it looked so familiar to her that she decided the room was empty, she was gonna walk into the room, and she walked in the room with this feeling of familiarity, and she walked up and looked out the window, and it hit her six years earlier. She had been in the hospital. She had been sent to the hospital for surgery, and was told she would never walk again. She was told that the arthritis was so bad that she couldn't walk again. She was told that she would need a hip replacement before they could let her leave. She was told that it would bother her the rest of her life. That was six years earlier, and yet none of that happened. And she used to look at that view every day and pray, and it came back to her. When she left that room, she was apologizing to God. She said, God, I am so sorry. How could I not think you hear me now when I look back on how faithful you were to me those six years ago? She said, God, I'll never doubt what you're doing because I know you've been faithful. One of the reasons you shouldn't let silence mess with you is because you already know how faithful God has been in your life. This woman knew even this short period she had crossed the line. Pressed on through the impossibility. So she pressed on through the silence. It kept happening. And the disciples got angry. And they said, Jesus, please tell this woman to stop following us. Here it was. She was bringing the noise. She was following them wherever they went. She was waiting on her time to get in front of Jesus. And the disciples went there. So she was telling the disciples, I need my daughter. He'll read the text. And it said, they said, Jesus, send her away. But Jesus didn't send her away. He's, but he did confirm her worst fears. In verse 24, he said, but he answered her and said, I'm not sent except to the lost sheep of Israel. First of all, this woman pressed through the impossibility because you got to know everything that was against her. First, she was a Greek, which means she was a Gentile, which means she was a non-Jew, which means the Jews had no, nothing to do with the Greeks. And here she was chasing Jesus. Second, she was a woman. In public, women were not supposed to be acting with a public display. So there was actually a gender problem against her. But she passed through the gender obstacle. Then there was a racist. She was a Greek, so she was also, there was a racial disparity between her. And then we look at it, she was, uh, being a Greek, she was a pagan. There was also a religious wall against her. But through all of that, this woman kept following. And when he did not answer her, he confirmed her 
their worst fears. Now, it sounds good when I tell you, trust God, God will make a way, press on through the silence. But you better know, at the moment you're going through this stuff, it is not fun. I don't know what this woman was thinking when Jesus finally turned around after untold number of days she was following him and said, I'm only sent to the lost you of Israel. I only can give, I only can bless those who are Jews. Those who, and Jesus was, but he allowed her. He kept going through this talk with her back and forth. You see this woman, though she did, she came face to face with her faith. That's what you come face to face with when the impossibilities start coming up. Okay, you done heard all the good preaching, and you done shouted in church, and you done read you some scriptures. That's easy to do when everything goes well. But when the impossibilities, when you're the one hurting, when it's your child is hurt, when it's your life on the line, when, that, when everything seems impossible because every voice is saying God can't do it. Listen to me. All you have left is your faith. But God is a God who specializes in impossibilities. That's Moses was bought back. God cleaned his criminal record, sent him to Egypt, the strongest nation in the world, and said, set my people free. And God gave him power as he continued to believe in faith. God, listen to your brothers and sisters, God will give you the power if you have the faith. And you, I told you earlier, all you need is faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. Ask Joshua. All he had was faith. God told him to march around these impregnable walls of Jericho. And then when you march, I want you to march and shout. Sometimes God will tell you to do the most outlandish thing. But his faith said, let's march and let's shout. And the walls came down. What am I telling you? When you get to the point you're facing an impossibility, you got to walk by faith. This woman could have walked away at that point. But she decided not to. Listen to me. Uh, there was a little girl turned the century. She had not traveled that much. And her father said, I'm going to take you on a train ride. Well, she knew the train was going over all these bodies of water, and she was a little nervous. So as she's sitting in, you can see the water coming before you see how to go over the water. And then she held her breath as she looked up, but a bridge popped out, and she rode over the water. And then they came to another body of water, and she looked up, and she was afraid. She hid in her dad's arm, and then the bridge popped up. She rode over the water. Pretty soon, this happened several times, she finally turned to her dad and said, Hey, Dad, I'm not scared anymore. Somebody put bridges all the way. Somebody has made bridges to carry a safety. You know that's how life is? Life's going to have fears. Life's going to have some days you struggle. Life's going to have some times when you got to keep your faith when everything's impossible. But you got to remember that same God who brought you is still making bridges. He's going to help you get through that trouble and get to the next trouble. Let's get to the end of this. I'm going to get to the part that everybody talks about in this text. Not only did she press through the silence, not only did she press through the impossibilities, she walked by faith and not by sight. You got to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The final thing is, you must press through relentlessly. Text says in verse 25, she then came to worship him, said, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good for me to give children bread to take and cast it to the dogs. This is the text. First of all, how in the world did she get from behind the barrier and behind the cycles in front of Jesus? Some kind of way, I don't know if she ran through them. You better read the text. I don't know if she ran around them. I don't know if they grabbed them and tried to stop her. But somehow she got right in front of Jesus. And it says she worshipped him and fell down and said, Lord, help me. And even though she did all of that, because she was relentless, because she said I'm unstoppable, because she said I'm going to keep bringing the noise, Jesus had a nerve to knock her down again. He said, look, it's not right for me to give the children bread to the dogs. Now, I know some of you understand Jesus did not just call her a dog. He was using a uh, similar, he was trying to use uh, to give an illustration to show that the dog represented the pagans or the Greeks or the non-Jews and the children's bread represented the Jews. 
He was saying there's some promises that God had commissioned him. Now his mission field, his purpose was to make sure I'm here to bring the household of Israel. That's all I'm going to do. Now we do know Jesus opened that up later, but we do know that right now Jesus said my mission is to bring them to understanding that I'm the Messiah. I'm not supposed to cast bread, miracles, cast bread, healing, cast bread down to you. You're a pagan. I got to take care of my children. But this woman was not done. Here's where I think Jesus had turned around and said, oh my God. See, like anybody would walk away crying if he called her a dog. He said, no, I done told you three times. This is back and forth. But this woman looked at him and said, Master, that's right. She didn't disagree with him. She said, well, even the dog can get a crumb. Did you hear it? I don't know, something ignited inside of Jesus and Jesus, I think all along he admired the woman because he had seen so many faithless children, so many faithless people who were Jews. I know he admired her, but it says he turned around. How I know it? If God says this, I'm going to show you something. If God says to her, woman, great is your faith. He said, great is your faith. And let it be done unto you. I don't know what the disciples did at that moment. They were shocked. I know this woman started shouting. But here is what I know happened. You want to know what happened? God said, great is your faith. Why was her faith great? Because it was a faith that brought the noise. It was a faith that was unstoppable. It was a faith that went through obstacles. It was a faith that didn't, that didn't just cry. He cried and prayed. You want to have God say great faith? No, do not you cry, but you cry and pray. You shout and pray. But no matter what goes on in your life, you keep following Jesus. And when the world throws up the obstacle, obstacle you want to tell the world, bring it. Bring it. I'm going I'm to bring the noise. You throw a noise at me, I'm going to bring the noise. I'm going to be unstoppable. Every time you tell me I can't, I'm going to keep trusting God. Every time you tell me he won't, I'm going to keep trusting God. Every time you say it's over, I'm going to keep looking up. Somebody ought to hear me. Can you tell yourself, I've got to learn how to bring the noise. I ain't sitting still while my life is going down the toilet. I ain't sitting here while my family is being destroyed. I won't sit here while I'm going crazy in my mind. I will be unstoppable and get what God has for me. Three things that we close this. What made it great? See, first of all, I told God, I will humble myself to trust you. I know you're going to give me something because I'm not going to stop. But whatever you give me, I'll take it. Did you hear that? She didn't sit around talking about, God, this, God, I got a head. She said, God, I'll, that made her faith great because she said, I'm going to humble myself and take whatever you give me. And then she said, I'll even be a dog. I don't care nothing about what you call me because I'm probably worse than what you can call me anyhow. She said, but I will trust in your grace and mercy to even take care of the dog. I believe God will take care of me in my worst day. And finally, I believe God was overtaken with this woman because she just said, I'm not going to stop. I am. I know Jesus said, if I don't give it to her now, she's going to keep following me around. You got to learn. Whenever it looks like people tell you what won't work, tell yourself, I'm getting ready to bring the noise. And I'm getting ready to be unstoppable in your life. The last verse of this text tells us the woman's daughter was made whole. And the last verse tells us from that hour that her faith kicked in. I'm telling you, if your faith kicks in now, your blessing will be now. This pastor Duncan is saying, God bless you. Remember, no matter what they say, keep bringing the noise, keep bringing the funk, keep being unstoppable, and God will give you his best. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down, but with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free 